I do actually follow Sean on. Do you shop, follow Sean? Yeah. Or Twitter, SPD? YouTube. And you yeah, yeah, I do. I have done, this. yeah. I have done, yeah. If I was going to say anything, and I will say it, and yeah. you can do what you like, I would say, it's just, I love what he says, but I just don't know sometimes if I understand what he says. <laughs> that's, that's done on purpose. You won't find those words in the dictionary. Thank you for supporting our channel. Thank you for supporting Wizan. Please like, subscribe, comment, and hit the notification bell for any future videos. I, I quite often refer to people as sweetheart or darling, and um, especially if they've got a beard. <laughs> well, well now, now we know. Now we know. <laughs> but no one's ever got offended of it in 20, 20 odd years. So no, there's a way you execute it as well. I, isn't it? So. I don't think I can execute darlings. I can't, can't get. Do it. I can't do it. So it doesn't come out right. So I stick love. I'm good at because it's, that was my market trader terminology that I would have used. Well, the old boys will. You know, they would refer to us as son, wouldn't they? Everybody's yeah. their son. Oh, I refer to everybody as son, even the old yeah. boys to, yeah, to, to wind them up. You like right, Sam? I think I said it the other day. Someone who's older than me. Yeah, yeah. Get yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I've yeah. got to say, we've known each other for quite a while now, haven't we, Dean? I was always endeared to you, Sean, when I first met you. Thank you very much. Um, and we touched upon um, articulating our points. And uh, Dave, Dave is the one who pointed out to me that you have. Um, you're like I thought the analogy is you are the Russell Brand of the cap trade, because he comes out with so many big words in a sentence. Russell Brand, I. I don't understand what he's saying. So it's like, articulate again in layman's terms, and I'll understand whether the point was negative or positive because you lost me somewhere along the line. You in this industry, you've always, always been passionate. And the thing that's uh, that actually is one of my biggest gripes, it's always one of the things I go on about quite a lot in all these podcasts, is if we have differing opinions, why do they use straw man arguments? And mm. they come back with, you're an idiot. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've, I've give you the points and you can dispute them, but your dispute is I'm an idiot. Well, first of all, it doesn't serve the cab trade well for us to be abusive. No. At any time. To it anyone. Doesn't, it doesn't serve us well. Um, so, like I said, I think it's better if we think we argue the game instead of the player. That's not a bad way to go about it. Mm. And the cab trade does have salient, arguable points to make. I mean, I firmly see taxis as being part of the eco-transport solution. Uh, and if we see that, we, we can inform ourselves and make those points and make mm -hmm. them clear. Uh, we're always going to have detractors. There's an yeah. ide ideological drive against the cab trade. We see it out there. But it doesn't mean that we don't have valid points to make. And I think that's the point. And if, if we can inform ourselves, we can be a lot stronger. We can go out there and say, actually, hang on a second, we can be like Paris. Paris is treating their cab drivers really well. They're treating, they, they are actually seeing them as an integral part of that solution. And I think that's how we want our politicians to be. We want political redirection and we've got to argue our points in order to get that. But it, the thing is, Dean, it doesn't just happen within our trade. I mean, I see our detractors look on us and I see that we're trying to argue our case and I see them coming on and saying the most appalling, hateful things to us. I mean, there's one particular person that turns around and says we are murderers and, you, really? you know, we are trying... Yeah, I mean, he's quite prolific out there as, uh, you know, somebody who's arguing... Against the side. taxi trade? Yeah, he's very much against the taxi trade. He's quite high profile. He goes on a lot of the news programmes, calls us murderers, and it, you know, in one of his tweets, and says, we, why do we hate children so much? Which is a despicable thing to say to somebody. What's his argument? Where does he get that from, the murder yeah. bit? Where's that? The, fact, the fact that you know, we want access to the roads, we argue for access to the roads. It makes sense that taxis have access yeah. to roads. Uh, it streamlines our service. It helps our passengers. It's better for us to be able to access our passengers that might see us as a vital service. But arguing that case, he sees us as just having a commercial interest and want to drive up those roads, which isn't the case at all. As a pollutant? As a pollutant, as, as a, just a vehicle that would drive up those roads. And it's, it is a, the thing is, it's a hateful thing to say. And it can o the way I see it, it can only be a bad case of projection when you're kind of disavowing your own hateful thoughts onto others. It can only be that because you wouldn't dream of saying such despicable things about people you've never met. And, and, and so it, it works both ways. It does, it, it's not just it, the cab, cab drivers don't have the patent on abuse. That's mm. I think he does, us a, he does us a favour. I think he's a good thing because, I mean, someone saying such things like that, if it was a cab driver saying it, we'd all be going, oh, I can't believe you said that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah it doesn't look good. So, in other words, it doesn't look good for him or anyone else he's supposed to support, does it, that he's saying such language like that? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, just kind of lighten it just a little bit. When we look on the demonstrations like Just Stop Oil, and we look on that, and they would possibly claim for the good of the many, so utilitarianism, mm-hmm. which is for the good of the many, they're being utilitarian by doing this demonstration. But by doing that, they are kind of disregarding the plight of the individual. And we have seen people begging them to let them through because they needed to get to a hospital appointment. And they have zero tolerance to these people saying, oh, no, well, this is for utilitarianism. This is for the good of the many. So we're not going to let you through. And there's something, uh, there's a school of thought out there that sees that as being quite psychopathic, that actually you would disregard the, the needs of the individual. So you must lack empathy. And I don't know whether you've heard of the trolley bus dilemma. Have you heard yeah, of Yeah, the where they split and they've got to kill five yeah, people or yeah, one the, people. The trolley bus dilemma is really interesting. For those who haven't heard, just quickly, the, um, you have the choice of killing five, the five people dying from a train coming down a track. And in order to prevent that, you could push a person onto the track. And that person dies instead of the five people dying. And on the surface of it, you could look on that and go, yeah, I can understand that. I'd rather save five people than one person. Utilitarianism. But when people actually really put some thought into it, they decided actually they couldn't do that because you're now not just a passive recipient of five people dying. You are now playing an active role mm-hmm. in killing somebody. And, and this idea that you would, the empathy in you, that you would actually experience their fear, their, their, their dread and the, the pain of their death means that you couldn't actually do it. And I think that sums up the Just Stop Oil protesters completely. The fact that they will have zero tolerance, stop people from actually moving on with their journey. And as a consequence of that, you've got people who might need hospital appointments, you've got carers who need to get to patients. And I just think the lack of empathy there. So maybe they need to reflect on what they're doing. And maybe they need to look at themselves as adopting a psychopathic uh, mentality. And that's good because now he's explained it. Wow. <laughs> Some of the big words that have been, you know, before I've watched and gone, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, yeah. understand. It's, Maybe it, you should change your style. You'll get castigated, Dave. I'll castigate, castigate yeah. you. It's yeah. interesting, though, isn't it? They think they're doing for the good of the many, yeah. having the utility there to say, right, no, we're thinking of the bigger picture. But the lack of empathy for people who might need to get to hospital is, is, I, is I quite think, extreme. I, I do think that, the, the, obviously, if you look at it from a marketing point of view, that they had a goal to achieve. They need to accept that what they are attempting to do doesn't achieve their goal. They're mm. creating monsters against that. They're going to say, I am now going to use more oil. Or they're, they're creating a mentality that's going to fight against it. Um, I know a lot of people that were very much that way minded. And their way of dealing with it was to move to a very small village in the middle of nowhere and live their life uh, in the peace that they were ex- dreaming of yeah, yeah. and just accept that that they can't change the world. And if they all just did that, that's one form of protest in some way. And I think it touches upon our forms of protests. If we do protest in any way that affects other people negatively, then you have to weigh up the the vibe. Is it going to achieve your goal? Well, I mean, we was whenever I've put this kind of argument over in a more concise way, I mean, the comeback has been, well, look at the taxi trade. They were doing a similar thing. Well, when we was organising protests with the ITA, It wasn't similar in any way. We had an awful lot of responsibility. We had to allow lanes for emergency services to Mm -hmm. come down. We gave out 50,000 flyers explaining to people what was happening. We was providing free taxis for people with mobility concerns. Mm -hmm. So we shouldered a lot of that responsibility. And I know because I did the risk assessments. So when you've got people like Just Stop Oil... Uh, yeah. and, and you've got uh, Extinction Rebellion and even Black Lives Matter, they aren't doing risk assessments. They, the onus was on us and responsibility on us was to do mm-hmm. these risk assessments. And I, I know what you're saying about, y- you know, we have to consider the public. But, but back in the day, when, we, when the ITA, the Independent Taxi Alliance, w- when we set that up, we had no choice. The political route had failed because the head of the political mm-hmm. route was the Prime Minister. He was in bed with Uber. He yep. got uh, the godmother of his child was uh, an Uber executive. You got mm. George Osborne, who was uh, gave front page commercial prominence to Uber on more than one occasion, and was in bed with BlackRock for six hundred thousand pounds a year, which was investing heavily in Uber. You got his best friend was at the BBC, uh, head of news at the time, which never reported accurately our side of the story. And then you yep. got Joe Bertram at the Employment Tribunal saying that. Uh, Uber was, is not party to the booking process, which, as you know, is a blatant contravention of the regulations. Mm-hmm. So at the time, we thought, 
well, you know, the cab trade in 2015, 16, 17 was in a very depressed state. We were thinking, what the hell do we do? The political route isn't going to work. So the only thing left to us was direct action. And so we made up the placards to let everybody know that there was corruption at the top and we was going to shout it from the rooftops. And I think, I, I think we was left in a position that there was nothing else to do. And a lot of the cab drivers, Dean, at the time I was talking to, their, their mental health was very bad because they felt absolutely impotent mm. and couldn't do anything at all. And by protesting, even if we wasn't going to achieve anything through the protest, yep. by doing so, made taxi drivers feel as if they were fighting against the system, feel as if they were actually doing something. And I'll tell you something, I would do it again in a second for that reason alone. Absolutely. I'd do it in a heartbeat because it made taxi drivers feel a lot better about themselves, the fact that they were standing up and fighting for what they believed in. Well, you just said something there that I never knew about the things. And that's and so now it comes down to the marketing of it and, or the, the, the public view of it. The, the parts that you needed to emphasise to the public is that there is a lane available for emergency services yeah. and for public traffic to get through. What we're doing is this. And um, all of those points were very, very good. And I have never heard them before. Yeah, we did. I, I, I mean, the thing is, it was a bit more difficult back in the day to get that message out. It's, it's very easy to get that message out now. We did have Periscope, which mm -hmm. we did that. That got about 10,000 views on Periscope, uh, a kind of a live streaming that went out Twitter at the time. So we were trying to convey the message in that way. And through uh, printing out 50,000 leaflets, we were trying to do it in that way. But you were limited. It, it wasn't, yeah. uh, the technology wasn't so pervasive back in the day. What if that you, you coupled that, they coupled the protest with free fares, free rides anyway as well? Because well, you could well, transport anybody out of the well, city. Well, we, we certainly did for people who Disabled. needed it. For people who needed it. Now, the thing is, the LTDA did do... Uh, free fares from Waterloo Station. I remember them doing free fares. But all that was basically happening was people people get who would get cabs ordinarily were getting a free fare to the city. So it wasn't really getting the message out to people who were using other options and wasn't aware of the situation. Question there is, you may not know the answer to this, why did the other groups that you just mentioned, why did they not have to do the same things then? What groups? Well, like Black Lives Matter and uh, oh. Trust the World. You just said, you just said those that they, they didn't have yeah. to provide an emergency lane. They didn't have they, to provide No, they one. didn't bother to do it. I no, mean, I don't think we had to bother. We could bring the stand to if we wanted to without any I, I thingy. Mean, uh, no, I had to do uh, risk assessments. And I, when we was doing the... Uh, By law? Yeah, when, when we was arguing against the LTNs, uh, I know you're going to chat to Eddie, so when we was organising the, uh, the anti-LTN uh, demonstrations in Islington, I did the risk assessments there as well. It seemed like... Uh, the taxi train, and by extension, those demonstrations as well, we were the only people doing risk assessments. It seemed like the Just Stop Oil, the Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter. It's critical mass, isn't it? When you've got critical mass, you don't have to really care about the system. The Extinction Rebellion and the Stop Oil, they're not telling you what they're going to protest. So they're doing kind of activist... Yeah, and, and also, they're not so identifiable. If we are there with taxis, we're identifiable. Mm. That's saying I would say, I would say, don't go with your cab. Where? Anyway, any protests? Don't take. Oh. Why take? Why well, take a lot a cab of it, so we, you can we, be punished? Yeah, we mm. did do on foot demonstrations. Originally, we did on foot demonstrations. Yeah, but well, now ma you masked up as well. Masked black, up. Yeah, black, 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 black gloves. Masked up. Yeah, why not? And Spray paint. Do it, don't they? Yeah, all these others do it. Yeah, why everybody. Not? Then yeah. you won't all get nicked, then will you? The thing is, psychologically, if you discredit the person, then you discredit their argument, don't you? And mm. I think there's a there's a lot of that about. So you you kind of you kind of bring it the if you impart the worst motives on that person, then their argument can't stand up either. And I think that's what's happening. To use a couple of your words, then, uh, Sean, it's an ad hominem attack, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yes, and I get it all the time. <laughs> 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 and uh, for those who don't know, they need to look it up in a dictionary. Yeah, look it up. Um, Why not? Tell us the answer. Protect the person and not yeah. yes. the subject matter, yeah, basically. Yeah, your, your argument is rubbish because you're six foot three. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that means nothing it still to makes your young. argument rubbish. Mm. <laughs> Even if he was five foot three. Yeah. I know a couple of people who've got a notice of intended prosecution. For On that. Those and ones. I would say every time appeal. Every well, time. yeah, why haven't they? Because Trevor said that he asked his legal team and they said that you probably won't win. Do you know if they've got it, any of them have got it, for setting on the right for the Waldorf or anything oh, like I, that? I, no, I don't know that. Because the, the part that will be illegal is if they've done something and the traffic behind them had to slow down or stop, that could be instigated as dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're doing the U-turn, and they've now put up the no U-turn sign, you said, Dave, haven't they, on the strand? If on they the do U-turn to get over to Waterloo Bridge, then again, you're, you're kind of hitting into the zone where the grey area is being eradicated. Mm. You've not turned right or anything like that. Usually these are restricted to PCNs, aren't they, and not 
notice of intended pros- prosecutions from the police. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the ins and outs of it, So, uh, and I'm not an authority on that, so I wouldn't know whether... I, I don't even know if those appeals have been upheld, but I would say... They stuck them at the bottom of the traffic lights, don't they? No... Uh, uh, um, no U-turns. Yeah, I think it's at Catherine Street somewhere. Right? I think I was driving by and said to you, "You know, I've not uh, seen those." What is interesting about that, though, where you could kind of do a U-turn is at the most dangerous place, which which is at the junction with Kingsway, where there is a break in the double yellows. There's no no U-turn sign, yep. so you go into that junction and do this U-turn, the most dangerous place you could do a U-turn, yep. and yet that's legal and crossing the white lines when it's perfectly safe to do so isn't. It's madness. Well, if it's U-turns that they've got a problem with, then when you pull up at the Waldorf, don't do a U-turn, do an S. Go yeah, look, and then chuck them out there, passenger law on the they, opposite side of the road, and then do your U turn. Think you back. were pissed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that, that worked. That. In many countries, it's illegal to be facing the oncoming traffic on that side of the road by parking. So if they've even found you parked and you're facing the oncoming traffic, you'll get a ticket because you shouldn't be in that position. It's never enforced in this country, though. Is no, it? not no. at all. But then jaywalking as well, I think, is actually illegal. No, it's it's never not, enforced. no, we don't have a no, jaywalking. We don't have a jaywalking. No. You sure? Yeah, yeah we don't have a jaywalking. Yeah. You're absolutely uh, arou- allowed to walk in the road. All right. Perhaps you shouldn't say that, but you're absolutely allowed to walk in the road here. Yeah. I've had it with Americans when we, uh, we walked them around somewhere. So we walk and they, they, they want to go for the crossing. And I go, it's fine, no, no, fine. We no, trust you to cross the road. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you're standing at the crossing and all the tourists are standing and you're on the red, the red man's there, isn't it? Stop me. Everyone, all the English people are just bowling across. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. When I first signed up to the Knowledge, I, um, I went and got books from Knowledge Point at the time. Cut that out. Yeah. Cut, cut. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's, a ca- there's a caveat. There's a caveat. I mean, I'm talking about 1999. We'd heard that you got a book out and yeah. I was, you, you know, I'm, I'm not a very obsessive person. I'm, I'm almost antithetical to being obsessive now, but Here I was go. back in the day. Yeah. Here I, we go. What's I, that I, one? Yeah. <laughs> antithetical. So if anybody doesn't know that one, that's spelled A-N-T. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we'd heard that you got a book out, so we came down to you. Now, I think you was doing it from your living room back in the day, yes. wasn't you? And it, was you down Burdett Road or yes. somewhere like that? You was down You're from that far back, Sean. You are that really... Far back. Go on. That far back. Yeah, so I think it was the late 90s probably. Yeah. So we came down there and you did a comprehensive book in the yes. day, didn't you? You did the 400 runs. Yep. You did the cross sections. And I always preferred the cross sections to the yeah. actual blue book runs. I thought the cross sections were great. Yeah. And you did the maps. Suburbs and, and the, the maps. Suburbs. And you was the only person that did the maps. And I, every, and I think we might have been the first year. I don't know whether you remember the year they brought 96. up the map test. Oh, oh, the map test. Oh, I don't know about the map test. test. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm, yeah. 2000. Yeah, probably. Two. Yes, that would make sense. I think we was the first year that did the map test. And nobody who hadn't looked at your maps was passing the map test. Nobody. Mm. Uh, so we was quite lucky. We came down, did your maps. And... Um, I, I still don't. Do they still do the blank map? No, no. Because oh, I never quite under. I understood why they brought in the map test mm. to like stop time wasters going onto appearances, but I couldn't understand the idea of a blank map because when they put it in front of me, it looked like a bowl of spaghetti with a uh, marker yeah. pen. It they was, had some terrible decisions back then. I mean, we never we we never had to deal with blank maps in anything mm. that we did, do we? So uh, I, I remember doing that, and I remember getting Kilburn. And I was very grateful to the maps because, as I said, nobody was passing the map mm-hmm. test because it didn't resemble anything. We did that, applied for the talk. I remember applying for the talk after I'd done your book. Whoever it was, I don't know because I, I never saw him again. He just gave us the talk. He was a pl- ex-police who'd done the knowledge. And he said to me, he went, um, said to us rather, he said, the average time it was taken back then was three years, four months. And he said he had completed it in three years, nine months. And I was determined to do the knowledge, but I could understand that sitting there, if people weren't so committed as me, that would have put them off. Because the idea of nearly four years, on average, the idea of four years Mm. on average is such an indeterminable amount of time to get your head around. You can't get your, you don't know what you're doing in four years time. If people are thinking, well, that's as long as I spent at senior school, you can't get your head around where you're going to be in four years time. So I thought, well, I'm still going to do it. But if, that, if that's the gauge, and we were told to use that as the gauge, I thought, oh, wow. And I, when we came down to pick up your book, you actually said to me back then, you went, it's achievable in 18 months, mm-hmm. which seemed unrealistic, but, um, or at the very least ambitious. But I did have time where I could commit myself wholly 
So I was able to live and breathe in. And I understand there's a lot of people who can't. A lot of people are time short, aren't they? So might have to do it part time. But I understand that I was able to live and breathe it. But I did use that 18 months as a target. And I managed to get the knowledge completed in about 19 months. Back in the day when I was being told the average time could have been three years, nine months, nigh on four years, I managed to do it in 19 months. And that's not, I tell you what, also, that's not blowing smoke at my own ass because I was able to live and breathe it. But I also didn't have a good sense of direction at all. I mean, my sense of direction was appalling. I mean, uh, my other half at the time, I mean, he chose to be a fireman. I chose to do the knowledge. Great choice. Uh, I mean, his sense of direction was amazing compared to mine. So I had to really go through it in a very methodically, in a very systematic way to try and technically get these roads into my head because I, I, I really didn't know whether I was going north, south, east or west. So I'll just say to people out there, it, it might not be your natural disposition to go out there and just automatically know where you are going. But you don't have to be. You put in the work and, you know, it's amazing what you can accumulate. Once it's done, it's absolutely done. And the only thing I can say, the quickest way through the knowledge is to do it thoroughly. Because Mm -hmm. if you try and cut corners, you're going to get caught out. Was you working? I worked in theatre and clubs at the time. So uh, I was able to just work evenings. And so most of the... And then I wasn't doing much in theatre. So I was able to revise what I did during the day. We went to... I I didn't come to your school because KPM at the time, when that was open, that was demographically yeah. Yeah. around where I lived. So we called over there. And, uh, uh, and and then I used to go out on the bike on the afternoon every single day. I even went out Christmas Day. That's how committed I was. And uh, But if you want to get it done, you really do want to get it done. And it's not a bad mindset to be in. Well, what you said there about the 18 months, I'm, I'm fully aware that what I'm doing when I'm saying that is I want you to feel motivated yes of course i want you to feel the vibe that you can do this quicker because it, uh, your thing hit me straight away if you said to me i'm going to do this in four years when they said it to me i said i'm not i'm not doing it for four years no way i'm going to do this in two years and my friend said yeah you can as well so that was it you got to have a but you, you can't go wrong as well there are lots of things that can go wrong so you've got to follow certain patterns and like you said about the cross sections that gave you the extra bit of roads what i'm seeing now with a lot of students they're doing a lot of overkill on learning preset runs mm. so they have a, a they're learning 2000 blue book runs kind of thing and then hoping for similar questions whereas the other scenario which is better is learn the blue book runs certainly learn the missing pieces which are basically the cross sections now which give you the additional intricate roads and then from then on learn to bloody calculate because learn to put the pieces together and make any run you like rather than having loads of presets and hoping you get asked presets if you've got the ability to calculate you will I think with it, the, like the bankers, people want to learn the banker instead yeah. of learning from the banker. Exactly. And learning from what the run was. So you may be something in there you didn't know. Go, oh, why does that do that? Yeah, oh, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. But don't recite the whole thing. No. Only, the only ones you want to recite and, and learn is, is the blue books. I mean, I did. I, I did a bit of overkill. I know sometimes your runs were different to knowledge points. So I, I thought I've got to know both. You knew and both. I think, <laughs> I think that, yes, I think that can overwhelm you a little yeah. bit because you give yourself too many options then and that can be, that can convolute everything once you're in there because half the time when you're in there you can't see in front of your nose can you so you've got to try and keep simplify it as much as you can once you're in there and try not to combine different (laughs) routes to try and impress the examiner i don't think that does anybody any favors Mm. i think they know that don't they They know when you're sitting there under pressure they've sat there themselves haven't they They yes they can see that you're working they lower the question i mean if you imagine you're an examiner and you start off with a very first question and it's a fairly difficult one you know it's difficult you know the two points are even difficult and then they don't answer anything. So great. You uh, you pitch them another one. By the end of it, you're pitching a Manor Station at Gibson Square. And you can see that they're stumbling across that one. Then you know. So the question is getting lower and lower towards them to see where their level is. That's generally what they're trying to do, gauge where your level is. And if they do end up asking you a blue book run, don't walk out there happy. Because um, they've basically tried to find out whether you even did that point part correctly. And so many people don't. That's one of the videos coming out soon, isn't it? <clears throat> the fundamental foundation of everything we do is our language. And our language is based on uh, the Blue Book. And if you can speak the Blue Book fluently, then you can think quicker. Well, here's one for all those knowledge students about to go for their first appearance. I'll tell you what my... I'm not very good at remembering things like this, but for some reason I do remember this. My very first run, I mm-hmm. was asked, was um, Cromwell Hospital to Carlisle Square. Mm-hmm. I thought I was quite lucky because I was able to see it. And I mean, there's nothing more satisfying when you're able to see it from the outset, is that that you don't have to really put much thought into it. And luckily, I was able to see that. Yeah. Uh, But, but, you know, you you talk to... It's not luck. 
Well, you talk to a lot of taxi drivers as well. A lot of taxi drivers will say, well, nobody had it harder than me. And I'm probably one of those because I think I was challenged as much as everybody. But uh, fortunately, I had 12 appearances and got through them and mm. it was okay. Well, there's something else people don't realise. The person who knows the most on the knowledge is the poor sod who's been doing it the longest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, knowing more on the knowledge doesn't mean you're better at it. It means you're worse. Yeah. If you did it quickly. I mean, here's one to show how I feel I was tested on the knowledge. We, we was at Penton Street and uh, remember opposite the carriage office used to be the Star Cafe, wasn't there? Do you remember yep, the Star yeah, Cafe? Yeah, yeah, we used to sit, yeah. We used to sit in the Star Cafe on the morning of our appearances. And uh, luckily, I was uh, I used to call over with someone who used to take the points for KPM. And she came over and, you know, sometimes you can be a bit eager to know the points. And that doesn't always no, help doesn't either because it. you start getting certain points in your head and then you ask something completely different. So that doesn't really help. But um, we were sitting in there and all of a sudden, one of the examiners came in. I don't know if you remember Mr. Burt. Yeah, yeah, Bill Burt. Bill Burt, right. Bill Burt, okay. yeah, Bill he's Burt. a student of mine. Okay, oh, brilliant, right. He came in and somebody was going, that's Mr. Burt, that's Mr. Burt. And we was all sitting around, so we was all straightening up, straightening our tyres like this. And he got his coffee and he come over and he went, looked at the list and he went, Mr. James. And we all sat around and go, no, not us. And he went, Mr. Day. And I went, that's me. He said, follow me. And I had to follow him out of the out Star of the cafe. cafe. I was trotting behind him up the stairs. And he went, can you believe I've had to get my own coffee? I said, oh, I'd have got it for you, sir. No problem. <laughs> oh, Groveler. Groveler. But I will say this. I will say this. It was probably the worst appearance I ever had. And you know appearances, they can be a bit strange. Sometimes they can go perfectly. You still yeah. get a C. Sometimes they can be pretty ropey and still get a C. And it was the worst appearance I had, and he still scored me with a C. And I think, well, maybe if he hadn't put me through that undue stress, mm. pressure, he might not have scored me. Maybe. I don't yeah. really know how it works. But, yeah, so there you go. If you think you're having it tough, what about that? And I didn't particularly have it easy. I had Dixon three times. Well, he's not hard, Dixon. Dixon. I, everybody felt a bit, oh, a bit about oh, Dixon. Oh, no. I mean, we, it's lovely talking about these examiners from that era. Um uh, O'Keefe is dead now, mm. so he was that same era. Bill Burt didn't stay long enough for me. No, I never saw him again. Yeah, he didn't right. stay long enough. He said, I'm going to leave, and I thought, oh. And they were, Dixon, Burt, and O'Keefe were all ex-police. They were kind of the last era of ex-police, and at the moment, Wilkin is the last of the police officers. So I had a classic run from uh, Dixon. He, uh, I mean, I was... By this time, I was getting through quite fast. And he asked me, uh, the Tufnell Park Tavern, to somewhere on uh, Stroud Green Road mm -hmm. without using Tufnell Park Road. And I was lucky in the sense that Dixon, Dixon was there when I first started doing 56s. And we used to call the whole sheet, even though 28s and 21s were difficult. We'd still you try still and should. And still, still, people still should do that. Well, that yeah, that's good advice. And, and he used to call that run. And I thought it's one of those kind of technical runs that you had to know, otherwise you, you wouldn't have a clue, would yes. you? So you had to go out there, learn those specific roads and commit them to memory. Otherwise, that's a fail, isn't it? So, uh, and then he left. I think Dixon left for yeah. about a year. And then he came back and they said, Dixon's back, Dixon's back. And I was thinking, oh, Dixon. And then I got Dixon and he actually asked me that run. He said, well, how do you know that? I said, well, you was here a year ago uh, and then you left. And I think and it was a run that you used to call. So I thought I've got to go out there and... And I think if there was a time I was expecting to get a D, then that would have probably yeah. have been it because I don't think he expected me to know that. So that that what there was a bit of luck that came yeah. with that. I just happened to be around when he had called that previously. You know, prior Otherwise, to your generation, these kind of questions didn't exist. They weren't allowed. Really? They, so there's been a progression that we've seen. So I've been doing this 30 years and it was watching the progression of questions from what was it, my day was more points, the absurdity of points that they could ask. Uh, your generation, they try to control the points because too many people complained about being our stuff that's not cab related at all. And to this day, I think it was a silly idea. What we're learning when we're doing the knowledge is not learning to be taxi drivers anyway. Mm. We're learning to earn a badge based on the, our awareness of London and everything else. And then when you get your cab, you learn to be a taxi driver. So the fact that they ask absurd points really didn't make any difference. It gave us the necessity to go out and look at absurdities yeah. so that we were still out in London. So they had a purpose. But they kind of cut those down and then came the the tech questions mm. that were being invented daily of getting from Sloan Square to mm, La Familia restaurant, mm. maybe without using traffic lights and stuff like that, which if you're ever hit with that question without pre-study, 
you couldn't answer it. Yeah, you yeah, couldn't definitely. get it. You needed yeah. pre-study. But with pre-study, if your level was right, this was just another easy question. In a sense, that kind of question is testing, are you doing the sheets? Mm -hmm. And then to sort of like make it even more difficult, most of the examiners are saying, no, you mustn't do the sheets. We don't like the point sheets. Oh, okay. You don't like the fact that we know yesterday's exam. If you did a, uh, any exam in, in, that you're studying, you'd at least have last year's version of it to sort of have a guideline to what's going on. I don't know what you'd use to revise if you didn't have They the wanted sheets. you to basically wing it. You, it would be impossible. No, There's a million places and a, a billion possibilities of lines and you want me to randomly practice them on the basis that I might be able to answer the questions you ask. And yet the question you ask, you ask the same kind of line with a few variations. So really, you don't want us to do that? Mm. Well, no exam is structured like that anywhere in the world, no. is it? That's no, crazy that's, to think. But that's where there's sometimes a little bit of a law unto themselves. Um, and the system, at the moment, everybody talks about the knowledge getting easier. And should it get easier? Whatever. The, the gatekeepers to it getting easier is simple. It's the examiners. Mm. The, the, you could tell people the blue book is now 10 runs. Absolutely fine. But with those 10 runs, will you be able to answer the questions in exams? No. So making it 10 runs doesn't make the knowledge easier, makes it harder. The examiners are going to ask their questions. You need to be good enough. And it seems with the amount of runs you've got to learn, you seem to be able to get good enough to pass those exams. But if the examiner wants to ask you just blue book runs, then the knowledge is a year. Mm. Eat less for everybody. If you knew it was just the blue book runs, I reckon I could do the 320 runs in 10 weeks. You could push yourself to do it. And that means you'll be able to answer mm. the questions they've got and your knowledge will pass out quicker. And still, that would be a higher standard by about four times than any other taxi test in the world if it was just learning our yeah. blue book runs. Also, the digital transformation of education has impacted traditional learning institutions elsewhere, hasn't it? And like you, what you've had to do, you now have to appeal to a yeah. contemporary student, don't you? So you utilise YouTube, you utilise online services because you know that's an aid for them to get through the knowledge, even though going out on the bike might still be the best way to commit mm -hmm. these roads to memory. You know that you've got to bring in these extra tools because that's what students expect nowadays. So mm. with all this to aid them, why is the knowledge taking longer when these tools should really be making it easier for them. We've found, I think I know the answer to this question. And it's just that there's a different degree of necessity to people today than there was then. And the necessity for us back then really drove us. Um, mm. We're in a different era by 30 right. years. So the kids and the adults, they work a lot more. They need money to survive a lot more. So they can't negate that part mm. to put focus on the knowledge. And if you, if you say like rents even... So the money we needed for rent back then w was substantially different for now. So we could put more aside and get on with the knowledge more than they can mm. now. Um, so there are far fewer people right this moment who have the position to do the knowledge full time. Then the amount of full timers is negligible now. Yeah, I thought that. I thought most people are probably doing it part time. Because just because of, uh, you know, the cost of living. True. And they, they then say, oh, but the knowledge is taking longer. And it's true. But you need to take that into consideration. Knowledge is taking longer, but there are a different category of people. Technically, those people would have still done the knowledge in five or six mm. years back then because they had this work regime. Mm. So it's more of a social construct. But also, I mean, we would eternally agree, wouldn't we, Dean, that... Not sure. Uh, <laughs> the, the knowledge would uh, work incredibly well as a natural quantitative restrictor in times of buoyancy. Mm -hmm. It worked really well. So you, yes. would, you would filter through the people who were most committed. Uh, the idea now that it, that length of time could uh, act as a impediment to entry to the extent that it might be determinable in the knowledge being disbanded, I think needs to be addressed. In Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. needs to yeah. be addressed. I compared this one to it's like uh, you're selling products and you're slowly watching the sales of your products go down and down and down. And it's because the product doesn't do what it used to do. And you refuse to improve the product until there's no one buying it. And then suddenly you're out of business. Whereas what you could have done as it went down is make improvements. So the knowledge itself, I'm, I'm afraid you're going to have to accept the fact that the knowledge technically, the standard of people passing the knowledge now is nowhere near the standard of the knowledge of people 20 years ago. Really? There's this different standard. The standard 20 years ago was based on competition. Mm. You had five, six, seven thousand people at certain stages doing the knowledge. And the ones that were 
uh, the best were coming out that year. The ones that wasn't would have to stay on it and would be in the subsidiaries waiting for their badges at later dates. Now, the standard of those who are the best is just nowhere near the standard of those. Is that because the numbers and the noise have gone down there? And so they've, they've allowed the numbers to go down and they've allowed the standards to go down. Yes, yes because they haven't reacted or responded to the fact of the numbers going down. It's, got, it's reached an absolute low level. We have very few people coming through. It's, it's starting to go up again now. Um, but when they're passing them out, they still have to pass people out. Um, back then, it used to be a 1,000 badges a year mm. passing out. If you pass a 1,000 badges out this year, there's no one left. The knowledge is over. I oh, know, it's only hundreds now per yeah, year, yeah. isn't it? The thing is, the thing is, unless... And, and I mean, you was there at City Hall in 2018. Yes. I was there at City Hall. Um, and back then, it was being treated like an existential threat to the knowledge. Mm. And even now in 2023, you know, there's a review going on, but p- that review should have happened. Yeah. Uh, they should have listened to the experts back in the day. And mm-hmm. I think that the problem with the taxi trade sometimes is... It's, it's very reactionary, but it's also very latent. So it also mm. takes its time to react. And I think that is that is part of the problem. But the thing is, even uh, the way I see it, even if you got rid of the Uber effect completely, mm. I think you would struggle to recruit because a lot of the opportunities that are available now for people, well, they wasn't available when we did the knowledge. So uh, certainly making money, monetizing YouTube, mon- monetizing online stuff, yeah. that is prevalent now. People work from home much more than they did now uh, yeah and so probably would see even leaving the house as a bit of a chore so to attract people is even if you got rid of the uber effect i think is is problematic and we've got to show in some way that we're adaptive to a certain extent um because otherwise if, if it's about if it's about the length of time people take to study the knowledge is it about the length of time people take to study the knowledge or is it about producing competent, safe, knowledgeable taxi drivers? Mm. If it's only about the time they spend doing it, then we've got really big problems, haven't yeah. we? And I think that's, that's the kind of situation we find ourselves. But also, I think if we even broaden it out, I think the, the irreversible challenges that now threaten our trade originate from the, uh, the rapid pace of industrial development, mm. uh, like online jobs, uh, coupled with the proliferation of, uh, of tech and encroaching big business because big business and tech go hand in hand, don't they? And I think a seemingly, and this, is, this point is debatable, but a seemingly adamant from TfL not to parameter the cab trade in some way to protect it. And part of that infuriates me because the regulator is the person that could do something about it. And mm. so I'm really infuriated by the way that they think, actually might think, and I'm, I, I don't have any uh, knowledge of this, but they might be thinking, well, let the cards fall where it may, as far as the taxi trade goes, which also infuriates me because the cab trade isn't designed, regulated industries aren't designed to compete in uh, or to be picked off in a free market system. They're not designed for that. Regulation is there for a purpose. Mm. And so just to disregard the fact that, oh, yeah, you can still have these quite stringent regulations, but now you've got to have corporations come in. Uh, that could effectively pick off the cab trade because they have the means to do so. I'm not saying that's inevitable, but they have the means to do so. And we argued at one point that it mustn't have been the intention of the Hackney Carriage Acts, the original acts, or the cab order of 1934. It must never have been the intention of them to allow third-party profiteers to come in and subvert the contract between the passenger and the driver. It must have been the intention to protect that contract between the passenger and the driver. Now, I know you didn't have apps back in the day, but what you would have had was hoteliers, concierge, you know, door ponces. Mm-hmm. They would have all tried to wedge themselves in and go and extract surplus value from it. Do you know what I mean? And so it must have been the point of the regulations, the legislation of the day, to protect that, that relationship between the passenger and the driver and it just seems that that's been abandoned somewhat to allow okay so the corporations have the means now to wedge themselves in and extract that surplus value and part of that part of that absolutely infuriates me but if i'm able to take a seat back and go okay well let me take an observant position here let me just uh, apply some detachment then i can look on it and say well maybe the regulator saying well you know what i don't want to shackle the you know i don't want to shackle technology too much because they might provide some kind of solution to the eco transport problem they might do and so if they do that the question we have to ask ourselves is what do we do about it and that's not a bad mindset to have is Mm -hmm. it to always think what do we need to do about it to ensure our survival not just our survival but the fact that we should thrive what do we need to do if that is tfl's position i'm not saying it is but if it is 
then maybe we should not absolve ourselves of responsibility and say, actually, if it comes down to us, what do we do? And the knowledge is the first, isn't mm -hmm. it? The knowledge, knowledge is absolutely the first. So where do we begin? We have to begin with the knowledge, don't we? Mm -hmm. So what would you do? What would you tell TfL? What would you say? This is what you need to do. The problem with TfL, we don't know what their agenda is. We don't know whether they want the, the knowledge just to stay as it is. So effectively, it, uh, it comes a point where they go, well, the knowledge isn't fit for purpose. It's not retaining a fleet. Or whether they will just disband it because they go, it's not fit for purpose. So do you know what I mean? So what do we need to do to make it fit for purpose? And the only thing we can do is address the time it's taking for drivers to yeah. get out. I, I would, sus I would um, give me a big word to say about, I'm thinking about the future. <laughs> I would suspect that their their, Meg. Yeah, <laughs> their motivation <laughs> when it comes down to it is they are trying to figure out how to get a share of our wages. TfL is trying to figure out how to get a share of our wages so that we are now no longer individual businesses, but we're employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing about getting rid of the knowledge, I do think that a lot of cab drivers have no idea how close we just came. Well, I think that the, the thing is about that uh, and them getting rid of the knowledge i mean if the problem problem with drivers that are looking on are saying the knowledge shouldn't change and it's mainly based on well i did it this way so you should do it this yes way. that's terrible that's yeah. that's what it's based on which doesn't make any sense at all uh if if tfl turned around tomorrow I, I mean i'm a you know i'm as passionate as anybody about the knowledge and if tfl turned around tomorrow and said you know what we're getting rid of the, rid of the knowledge then they would be justified in doing so because mm -hmm. if you look at the fall off, they can say, "Well, you know, we can't Doesn't retain work. a fleet." This is, all it is is a licensing process, yep. and if it's not retaining a fleet, then it's not fit for purpose. And they could do that tomorrow, and we'd be up in arms about it. But there's nothing we could do about it. Yep. So I am saying, right, imminency that we actually do something about it, and at the very least, do what we can to retain a fleet because yep. that because a, a reduction in the fleet reduces us to the gondolas. Yes. You know, that offer yeah, a yeah. specialised service. We'll be, we'll be we, driving around Hyde Park. Abs absolutely. And we, we become a non-essential service then. And there's mm -hmm. absolute, you know, the people standing outside Euston Station, certainly the people standing outside in Waterloo yesterday, see us as a valuable, vital service. And we know our, in every fare that we pick up, we have made that person's journey through this crazy metropolis sometimes an awful lot easier. Easier for some than others. But we see every day how valuable we are and how vital we are to a person making that journey. That wouldn't exist in the same way if we were gone. So we see that, whether TfL are interested in that and they're just interested in some, you know, kind of ideological approach of how transport should be, then that's a different matter. But, but if we shoulder the responsibility and say, well, what do we need to do to ensure our viability? I don't think that's a bad mindset to have. Darling? Well, 100,000 times 1,000 is it's, it's 100 million. Yes. 100 million. Yes. So this is my right. thing. So you have a system at the moment which we gain and earn our badges, which is perfect, but uh, the system collapses, goes away, and TfL are the gatekeepers, and they are the ones that give the badges, and instantly they would charge for it. They're going to sell 1,000 badges a year. 1,000 cab drivers come out every year. If drivers give their badges back, £100,000 for a badge. One hundred million pounds for annual income just on selling the badges to new drivers that want to spend a hundred thousand pounds on it, and the prices in America when they did the same system reached one million dollars for a badge. So they're speculating that one million dollars will be earned back. So at the moment we're moaning about a seventy thousand pound cab. Well, when it comes down to it, they will be able to sell your badge for a hundred grand to someone who would want to take it, rather than you doing the knowledge. There'll be people that will spend the hundred grand, and then taking on further from the American system, the hundred grand is just a badge holder who doesn't have to use the badge. He can then rent mm. the badge to a badge user and then take percentage of that income. I also saw when when kind of Uber came into the market and there was this. They did everything they could. They even threw the kitchen sink at trying to get that system to work. It certainly wasn't about a free market or tech. It was a, about a systematic attempted takeover of a regulated yes. trade. Yes. And that's what it was. And they, I think they would have loved us to have been under the umbrella of one corporation, which they could just deal with the one person as opposed to dealing with, you know, 15,000 cab drivers.
Yeah, and more so, this is why none of us should ever have ever, anything to do ever. with Uber, no matter what it is. You can have a principle about app firms or whatever, but Uber actually tried to decimate totally. our industry completely and totally. take control of it. All the others are just players in the market, and you can go along with it. And they may have some uh, long-term goals that they're trying to do, but Uber were not hiding nothing. They no. came to destroy this industry. Totally. And, you know, it, it's a, z- a company with zero ethics. I zero. mean, this is a company that domiciles its tax affairs abroad, did sweetheart deals with HMRC, mm-hmm. took money from countries who commit human rights violations in order to predatory price local competitors out of the market, which basically with us was us. And yeah. that's what they did it for. They that offered these predatory subsidies so we would be eliminated out yeah. of existence. So anybody that considers actually going to work for that person, you know, somewhere down the line, if the cab trade, if we do enter a recession and the cab trade suffers because of wider impacts, then they will take advantage of that in a split second. Yes. So don't do that. <laughs> well, I don't, you wasn't considering it, was your day? <laughs> I don't have many militant ideas, but I just think that you if you miss the point of what Uber tried to do to us, and if you think that the other our companies are the same, no, they're not. That one company mm. did everything yeah. it possibly could to destroy us. And it was the fact of their predatory pricing, the fact that they had billions to lose in terms of money they could put in to lose. We're working to our little profits. They don't care if they're losing 50 billion a year because they are investing in the industry collapsing and then they have control and their billions totally. come back. Totally. So Surely the number of drivers who go to them is going to be minuscule now, isn't it? Should be. It's you would have thought be, so. Yeah. You would have thought so. So what's the answer then? What's the answer? What do you mean? The answer well, to answer what, to, to, to the n- saving the knowledge and the cab well, trade numbers that, and everything in I think a, in, a in the first instance, I think, uh, look, I'm... I'm very reluctant to say they should reduce the area. I know that that's been discussed. Yeah, no, I don't want the area reduced. I think the six mile radius is the six. That's the knowledge. That's the, that's the radius. That's what needs to be learned. I think the time, the intervals have to come down. I think the, uh, you asked me and I'm not, again, I have to preempt this. I have to caveat it by saying I'm not an authority here. I, you know, I, don't have authority to speak for anybody. It's just an opinion like most cab drivers. Yeah. But I would, I would, Reduce certainly reduce the time between fifty sixes. I, I find it a bit odd that you're tested at the same stage for four appearances, maybe. I mean, that is a stalling tactic of some sort. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense in a sense. They've divided these things up, but you do know back in the day you could do one appearance back in the eighteen yeah, hundred one appearance. Remember. Then yeah. it would be four appearances you could pass out in, and then average in the eighties was something like seven. And then it was only after the eighties into the nineties it became twelves and above. And they kind of liked the amount of visits yeah, you can get. Yeah. But the biggest thing that would have really just uh, sorted it out completely would have been no fees. No, uh, absolutely. And I agree with that because the the way they want to homogenise the, uh, you know, private hire with taxes, which we've always argued to be s- more separatist about that. We've wanted to disassociate with private hire, but we've lost that battle. They're always going to combine both services. And mm. I would say, why can't they take money? from all the money they are making from 110,000 private hire and fund the knowledge. They could even offer grants yep. for, for students. They're not going to do that. They're, they're not, not going to do that. But the initial fees for a driver to get started on the knowledge went yep. back in the day. Didn't, I think it did cost us about £50, which was conceivable. It's me zero. It's cost me zero. Yes. Well, there in you go. Day, in the 90s. Why it, it should be cost. And also, and also, I remember when I did it under, I think I was just about finishing up when Ken Livingstone came in and he was offering, uh, I know uh, you could have uh, job seekers allowance, Mm-hmm. And there was also affirmative action, wasn't there, when there was providing yeah. bikes. Whether that worked or there not. There was Chelmer training as well. Yeah, one. yeah whether that was, uh, whether it worked or not, this was assistance. Yeah. And so why why potential cab drivers are having to fork out these initial fees is beyond me. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the very least, that's something TfL could do. Well, they did these um, charges, the changing of the system. And the redlining was all introduced to reduce the numbers because the system was being clogged. I've got to say, but I, I agree with you on the redlining. That doesn't make sense, certainly in times of when you've got nobody coming through the knowledge. Yeah. But redlining was the thing that drove us. The idea that we would be redlined was, oh, that was just horrific thinking that yeah. was. So we thought we cannot possibly be put in a situation uh, to be redlined. But it, it was grossly unfair. We had uh, a, a couple of lads who were calling over on the table next to us and they were both similar levels with their knowledge and one of them went straight through the other one was redlined and yeah. didn't get out for you know it might have been a year 18 a year months difference. after yeah, yeah. It's, it was incredible and yet they were pretty much on a par with each yeah. other so it could be grossly unfair just depending what happened on the day when you was in your appearance lack of examiners isn't it as well you go through on a different string of examiners yeah you go on a harder route yeah 
So there wasn't that. They tried to make it fair. They tried to give you different examiners, making sure you everybody got the same thing. The only way to make it fair is to have twelve examiners and a twelve examiner cycle, mm-hmm. and then everybody got one of those uh, on their way through. And if you scored with each one, but they, they haven't got that kind of system in place. So the redlining was a disaster, really, for me. They've been so successful. Then Uber came along at the same time. That that's the point. You made these changes to reduce your numbers. But now you, you're in a position that's the opposite. Now you need the time wasters because if you've got no one to examine, you've got no job. As soon as you've got no examiners examining people, it's over. And they really nearly mm. met that criteria. And they needed to do things to make people be on the knowledge that were the old zombies back in the day that were not really going to do it in two years. You needed the people that were going to take five and six years. And to get those, when I was on the knowledge, there was a lot of people that would sign on because it was free and they knew that one day they'd get out. So they kept their full-time job. They parted, did a little bit of dabbling with the knowledge every now and again, went for their appearances, were terrible, slowly accumulated some knowledge. And years later, they did actually pass out, but maybe even 10 years later. So they would say, I did the knowledge in 10 years. But really, no, you, you, if you accumulated the study time you put in, you probably did it in two or three years, yeah, yeah, but you didn't do yeah. that much. So they had to make changes. And the, the one thing that would make it accumulate quickly is the taking away the fees and getting people on. And that's the thing with what Free Now have done. They're paying for everything for their drivers to do the knowledge. Yeah. Everything. So their driver now thinks, well, I'll sign on anyway. So they sign on and they go for appearances. And suddenly you've got people taking appearances. Whether they finish the knowledge, whether they give up, whether they're rubbish at it or not, doesn't matter. They're on the knowledge and they're keeping the numbers there, which keeps the examiners in jobs, which keeps the knowledge going. Yeah, it's crucial. It's crucial. And I will say to people, you know, once you've done the knowledge, you've got your badge. Even if you didn't enjoy the job. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are some people out there, it takes them 40 minutes to not enjoy the job. I mean, I think the job is great. I mean, like I said, I studied afterwards, but I realised after studying afterwards that I preferred driving a cab. So, I, I mean, it, to me, it's a great job. But even if you don't enjoy it, being a taxi driver allows you to have a platform to go and do something else. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's brilliant. You might, like I went on to study something else, you could study something else because you have the flexibility to do so. Yeah. And you don't necessarily have that flexibility in another job. So it's a, it's a brilliant position to be in once you've got your badge. What's your background then, Sean? Where, where the school days and the area that you've been brought up I, in? In the Midlands. Uh, I, I, was, cool. I was born in the black country. And you don't uh, have a Brummie accent or anything? No, well, I've... I've Lived in London for four, four, 40, 40 years. So, I mean, there must be some entrepreneurs in the cab trade. It must attract some and they can... It did that, in the day. This did. is the thing I see less of now. So when I was doing it in the 90s, you'd be amazed. I was doing the chief of police. Chief of police was doing the knowledge. Uh, there were lawyers and people like that doing the knowledge. And I don't know why. There was just this thing that the knowledge and being a cab driver was this safety net. For whatever it was that they were doing, there was... Uh, professionals back then that were doing the knowledge that I don't mm. see coming through now. Well, police were also, it was one thing they could study while they were still a policeman. Yes, but they, they couldn't they could actually have, study. when you said about the exam and I said he'd done it in three years, eight months, mm. I was wondering if it was, was it post 2000? It was, uh, well, I got out in about 2001. I'm okay. not, I'm not, so I know people know time yeah. and day when they get out, but I think I was about 2001. Right, prior, I think it's prior to the 2000 where before the TFL changeover. You couldn't be an examiner and drive a cab. You couldn't be yeah. a policeman and drive a cab. That was the case. Then. Um, yeah. And then I, it changed and you could do these uh, extra things. And what the examiners used to be was someone that was on 28s, nearly always a policeman. You get to 28s and the head examiner would ask if you'd like to be an examiner and you'd become an examiner and finish your knowledge off whilst you're an examiner and you could not drive a cab. You're an examiner now. And when you left... You could drive your cab. So it was a choice you made to kind of take a cheat route to yeah, the yeah, end yeah. of the knowledge. There's an interesting study in New York taxi cabs. I don't know. Actually, I don't know whether you've read about the history of New York taxi cabs. It's quite interesting. Mm-hmm. I mean, I they did known. deregulate. So any regulator out there that's thinking of deregulating, that the, ho- the horror stories that came out of New York because they, that because they deregulated, you had all the cartels moved in and it was absolute bedlam. So Wh- uh, What year is this? Oh, before we were born. But, but interesting, they did a study about why, was there a, why is there a lot less taxis available when it's raining, which obviously makes sense to us, doesn't it? Because when it's raining, there's more demand out there, so we have more jobs and you know, mm-hmm. so there's less cabs available. But they were saying it was disproportionately so, so that when they spoke to drivers, they recognised that actually most drivers, 70-80% of drivers, work towards a target. 
So once they've made their target, they go home, which is me, mm -hmm. absolutely me. Exactly. Target based. Yeah. Yes, I meet the target and get out of it really quick. And they were saying, well, with eighty percent meeting their target, the most entrepreneurial mindset of people out there would be the ones that optimize their earning potential that go, okay, it's raining now. I'm going to work around the clock. I'm going to maximize my earnings here because I've got the opportunity to do so. And those who are not so, uh, not such an entrepreneur would go home uh, and, and meet their target and get out of it. So if you're the kind of person that goes out there and works around the clock when it's raining, maybe, you know, you've got but an entrepreneurial Sean, the, the, the mindset. Maths, the maths behind that are quite difficult. Because oh, it's, it's tentative link as yeah. well, isn't it? It's if not you did a, if, it, if it's buzzing and there's people coming all from everywhere, you do an extra long shift and suddenly find that you can't go to work tomorrow because you're too tired. Whereas you would have yeah, done two shifts that would have took the same money. Yeah, I'm exactly that, that mind. I've done all that. I've yeah. stayed out late. And then in the, in the next morning, you, you, you're dog tired, aren't you? And, and you just think, okay. you know, I've done it up doing less today. Yeah. yeah. What's the point? So it's, well, it would be a point if you wanted to have a lazy day. But yeah. I, I think actually it works worse because the lazy day is you knackered. Whereas the two working days, you've not been knackered. So you've done the same money with two eight hour shifts. And you're not feeling fatigued. Or if you're going to have the day off the next day, for some re other reason. But you'd you have think, to, you'd I'm going to work off. a bit harder today and that'll make up for the things I've got to do tomorrow because I'm off tomorrow. So yeah, I'm going to if stay you don't want to be yeah. tired the next day as well, though, Dave. Well, yeah. if, you, if you work it, I mean, um, you've done, like me, you've done the, the complete cycle shifts. I haven't done a 24 hours, but I have done some extreme 16, 17, 18 hours where you just keep taking the money and you love it and then realise... Your body clock's gone bananas oh, yeah, now. I've, I've never yeah. done a 16 hour day. I don't think I've ever done a oh, 12 hour day. Oh. Yeah, I've done them, yeah. I, I mean, not driving as well. I've done like 36 hours. But oh. not driving. That was a, a, some TV commercials and that. And we, we actually dozed off in the car while we was looking after the set. Right. But it got to the point where you could smell your feet through your shoes. Oh, dear. <laughs> so it wasn't oh, a good thing. Things I don't really to look forward to. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, no, I, yeah, I've done that. But look, as always, I would say, you know, potential taxi drivers out there it's a brilliant job There's, it is it's a so unique job. in the sense that once you've got your badge that day you're out there earning a living and yep. you know you're your own man if you want to go off and do something else then you can it's, it's a, just a brilliant platform to do that and on that it's one a brilliant so job. don't give your badge up keep no. it oh, pay madness. I don't understand it don't let it slip even if you do not work the the, the um, terms of proof that you worked is very very yeah. limited you can easily get away with it keep your badge going keep paying for every three years because the way I see it you never know when necessity is going to come back round so again. I think you've got to keep choices on your side. Yes. You? And also, and also the process, it, it's a symbol of the process you've been through, isn't it? And yeah. the process is quite often more valuable than the result mm -hmm. somewhere down the line. The process, like I remember on the day I got my badge, if someone would offer me a million pounds, I'd have probably gone, you know what, I'm going to take the badge because of the process I had gone through, because mm -hmm. of that sense of achievement. Now, I might look back on that in retrospect and think you know a million pounds would be nice thank you very much but i think on the day just that recognition of what you've been through and what you've achieved is really really important absolutely i mean what we achieve is pretty amazing but also i will say this it, it, one thing about it i mean i don't suffer from loneliness particularly i find it quite a reflective place to be i mm -hmm. quite enjoy True. it but i know there might be taxi drivers that might experience loneliness doing it but if you there is so many sometimes it's easy to be critical and focus on the, you know, the things that are not great. But there's some fantastic things out there that are taxi related, like the charities, the yeah. taxi charity for military veterans, the London Taxi Drivers Charity for Children, the the uh, the Worshipful Company of Hackney Carriage Drivers, they, the trip to Paris, absolute wonderful things. And I think if you get, in, you know, get involved in some of the wonderful things the taxi trade provides, then you feel more invested in the mm. job itself. You yeah. feel prouder about the job you're doing. And so... Uh, get involved because uh, they need people involved. I'll give a shout out as well for the London Taxi Drivers Charity for Children because they have uh, they are up for an award. It's, I think it's called the Smiley Face Film Awards. They've, they've done a short film documenting their trip to the wildlife park in the summer, which was absolutely brilliant day out. And, uh, and it really does convey what the charity is all about. And they're up for this award and they've got to get over the first hurdle to the voting stage. So if you go online, you can find them that they're up for this award, vote for them, get them to the judging panel and at the very least, even if they don't win, it gives the committee who do it all voluntarily, yep. do it for nothing, gives them a night out because it really is deserved. So that's the London Taxi Drivers Charity for Children. So vote for their little short Brilliant. film. Yeah. Good. Can we have a link? Yeah, I'll put the link up. Get People who get involved in all these charities do do a wonderful job. So it's worth supporting them and get involved. Would you say still do the knowledge, Sean? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean... It, 
the thing is, time folds in half, doesn't it? And twenty years goes by very quick. And maybe I oh, does it does it? Yeah, <laughs> maybe I think I might not. I don't know what I would have been doing in twenty years' time back then. But yeah, I definitely do the knowledge. Like I say, the process of doing it and the sense of achievement from doing it is far greater than just being given something. Yeah, it is. It is brilliant, and it's uh, that it will serve you well. What I will say is. You know, motivation begets motivation quite a lot of the time, doesn't it? And I think the quicker you try and get through it, that then that motivation feeds itself, yes. doesn't it? Yeah. And I will say as well, you've got to have discipline because there are days you're not going to feel motivated, mm -hmm. uh, but discipline will get you up and get you out there. Yep. And yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't think you'll ever meet a cabbie, even if he doesn't do the job anymore, even if he moans about the job, I don't think you'll ever meet a cabbie that regrets doing the knowledge. Mm. And I think that's important. That's really important. As you say, you can go on, can't you? I mean, lots of entrepreneurs now, even like something like eBay or something, you're going to sell something, do something, you can fund it by being a cab driver. Yeah, that's until exactly. You, yeah. Until you earn enough money from whatever it is, YouTube yeah. or whatever. And yeah, it allows yeah, you to gamble because yeah. you don't need to earn money. So you can speculate on stuff where you're safe with an income to, to survive and gamble on something, that a project that might make you more money, might uh, give you another string to your bow. And just on, just on the back of that, look, I... As virtue of being a cab driver, I transport children with social and educational needs as well as physical disabilities to and from school every day. That's what I've done since the beginning of lockdown mm -hmm. uh, because they needed cabs to transport kids. They still needed to go to school, but they needed to socially distance. So we managed to get about 30 cab drivers to do this work, which kind of kept the walls from the door during lockdown, which was brilliant. And I still do that work now because and, and I just think what a wonderful thing cab drivers do yeah uh, and don't get the recognition for doing it because there's hundreds thousands of cab drivers doing that every single day and they never get the recognition but again that investment in what you are doing and it's very very difficult not to be moved uh, by your the, the the relational aspect mm. of transporting these kids you by extension you get to know their families you get to know their carers and it really is rewarding work so if you want regular work as well, that's available to taxi yeah. drivers. And sometimes we don't think uh, down those lines. We just go out every day, you know, bit dog eat dog, try and make your money, uh, you know, come home saying, I've, I've done my money. But there's some wonderful things that you can get involved in like that. It's brilliant. It really serves a purpose. It's really worth doing. Did you see Poppy's Fish and Chips this morning? On the no. Cab drivers have been going in there eating. Which one? Uh, uh, Hanbury Street. Okay, yeah. And then they've been paying for their food and then paying for another meal and sticking the receipt on the door, and there's a, a thing up there saying, anybody who can't afford the food or is hungry, come in, take one of the receipts, go up to the desk and they'll cash it in and give you dinner for nothing. Oh, nice. You see, it's all those kind of generous concessions on an individual basis. No no one knows cab drivers do that. And it, it, it's such a shame because they don't do it for the glory, but the fact that it's being done is quite remarkable yeah, yes. because nobody else in any other profession is doing that. Two you who done it, I don't know if you put this in, but I, I see it. It was Mr. Shaw, that, or the former Mr. Shaw. He like, done it. He, no, he put, the, he's got the, he put the picture up on his uh, Twitter. Right. And it was him saying, this is what's happening. All right, and so what, what did you see this morning then on the news? I've said it. You well, saw I'll see it. this. Oh, it was his Twitter. Yeah, yeah it was Mr. Shaw. Look, he's now called, I used to be Mr. Shaw. Uh, Which means he can swear now. Yeah, no, he was a good examiner, actually. Yeah, yeah, Very yeah. good. You didn't yeah. want to, did you meet him? I have met him, yeah. yeah good example. Sean, it's been lovely having you. Brilliant. I hope you'll come back and do other things. Definitely. Sometimes I prefer doing other people's stuff than doing my own because it's good to mix it up a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, you're just hitching your wagon to our star, isn't it? That's what they say. No, I like it, but I like it like that. Yeah, I yeah. like it when you, when you get different from when, when, when I see Sean on his own. As I say, sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I do get a little going, I like it, but I don't know why I like it, kind of thing. <laughs> 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 I shall have to do it in, yeah, yeah. in the nude. I suppose you're going to leave that one in there. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's going to be the problem. I like it, but I don't know why I like it. <laughs> and I do, Thanks and I'm going to say, I'm, I'm being honest, I do, I go... It comes out. So what, what on earth was he saying? Yeah. <laughs> some, no, of the, some, of the those big words, some of those big words are just above my pay grade, and I go, oh, I don't think you're so, articulate. Really. You know yeah. it. You no, know a big word or no. two. No. Yeah, dear. You're no. just being ostreperous. No. Yeah. But I, I did think I, I, I did think Dave's in. I'm going to have to come in and dumb yeah, down a little bit. Yeah, down yeah, down <laughs> <laughs> That's why he started explaining the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just for me, really.